With 14 aerial victories in two different aircraft, retired Israeli Air Force Brigadier General Amir Nahumi has played major roles in many combat missions. Nahumi graduated from pilot training and earned his commission in 1968. During the War of Attrition and the Yom Kippur War, he flew over 100 combat missions. In the first air battle of the Yom Kippur War, Nahumi and his wingmen engaged a force of 28 enemy MiG fighters, downing four. For this action, he earned the E Tour Hamafet Medal for battlefield service above and beyond requirements. Following his tour as an F-4 squadron commander, Nahumi took command of Israel's first F-16 squadron. After completing F-16 training at Hill Air Force Base, Utah, he immediately began training for Operation Opera, the Israeli raid to destroy Iraq's Osiric nuclear reactor, which was capable of producing materials required for nuclear weapons. After multiple failed diplomatic and covert attempts to stop Saddam Hussein from acquiring the nuclear capability to strike Israel, Prime Minister Menachem Begin authorized the aerial raid. On 7 June 1981, Nahumi, along with seven wingmen, flew through unfriendly airspace at 100 feet above the ground for 600 miles to enable the surprise attack. In 30 seconds, the eight airmen dropped 16 2,000-pound bombs through the reactor, destroying Iraq's nuclear ambitions. This attack immediately drew strong international criticism and was condemned by the United Nations. However, 10 years later, the mission was celebrated by those who'd condemned it when the Desert Storm Coalition was able to liberate Kuwait from a non-nuclear Iraq. Air Command and Staff College is proud to honor Brigadier General Amir Nahumi as an eagle. Please join me in welcoming Brigadier General Amir Nahumi, interviewed by Major David Schur. Folks, I, I, I need a waiver here. Uh, although I'm practicing English for the last, I don't know, 65 years, <laughs> I still think in Hebrew. And in order to articulate my thought here, I need to translate online the Hebrew to English. And it is kind of difficult because Hebrew is from right to left and English is from left to right. And I can ex maybe give you an example, an episode that I had when I flew AH, AH-1, Cobra helicopter, as part of my uh, job. Night formation, night close formation. Now you imagine that a, a fighter pilot, when you go to add power, he goes like this. When you want, to, you want to, in a helicopter, you want to add power, you go like this. So imagine how is it to, to, uh, to keep up formation at night when all the time you have to think Forward, backward, forward, backward. <laughs> so this is about translating from Hebrew to English. Uh, I also reckon that you folks want to hear the uh, the story, dull story of the of the of the raid on the nuclear reactor. So why don't we just follow George Lucas and start with episode four? <laughs> <laughs> And then, if you can buy us some more time, then we can go roll back to episode one, two, and three. <laughs> How about that? Sounds good, sir. Sure? Absolutely. I'm you almost are sure. sure. I'm very, very, very sure. <laughs> so if you don't mind, to start, how about we go to November 1980? Can you explain what was going on at that point? Yeah. Why don't we go back 5,000 years ago <laughs> and we start? <laughs> And we have a look at the neighborhood that we are living. Uh, I think the best way to describe it, that if I was an American boy, I would tell you, I'm from Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It's not my, my fault. OK. Somewhere here, there is a mountain with olive trees, when 
Abraham, the father of both the Jews and the Arabs, was called by God to sacrifice his son to show his devotion to God. And luckily for him, he did it. He went up there, took his son, put him on a stone, took the knife, and wanted to slaughter his son for God. And then God said, hold it. You prove your point. Here's the goat. Put, him, put the goat inside. And he put the goat. And from that time, all of the world, maybe except China, wants this mountain. It started with the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, Roman. After the Romans, when they, when they turned into Christianity, came Muhammad from, from Mecca. And after him, the Crusaders came. And after the Crusaders, the Turk Ottoman Empire came there. And after them, UK, Great Britain, and France came there. And only in 1948, when the, uh, the um, United Nations uh, decided of some kind of separate this small land, by the way, from here to here, 500 kilometers. From here to here, 80 kilometers. From here, Tel Aviv, to the border, eight kilometers. So can you imagine the neighborhood? By the way, we call ourselves always an aircraft carrier because we have so many airplanes, and this looks like an aircraft carrier. <laughs> um, so if we jump to 1921, the British, like they did in several places in the world, they make arrangements there. They put up the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, the Hashemite Kingdom of Iraq. They set up the King Faisal in, in, in Saudi Arabia. And in Palestine, uh, which was the, the name of Israel today, they put uh, the High Commissioner. Uh, in 1963, and uh, there's in Iraq a, a, a nuclear program start. And uh, because uh, basically Bakr was the, the president of Iraq, but Saddam Hussein was the man behind the throne, and he did everything. So what we were seeing along this time, and basically until 1978, that Saddam planned to build an atomic program for we weapon grade under the coverage of Atom for Peace. And 10 years later, when I uh, was invited here when this was recognized. I asked the people who was, who was uh, invo invited there, Iraq, atomic weapon for peace, they are drowning in oil. Give me a break. <clears throat> so it went on and on, and but just by, I just uh, jumping because we don't have, to, too much time for that. Uh, people who want to make research on this can get these slides and make some if they want to make a research. And uh, I would want to jump to October uh, At this uh, month, government, Israeli government has two critical uh, meetings where all, as you see in the, in, the, in the video, that all the diplomatic efforts, all the covert 
uh, operation that uh, the Mossad did didn't help. The program went on. And uh, Menachem Begin said in this, in this uh, government meeting that there is a clock above our head and it's ticking. And he meant that according to the information that he had, that in September of 1981, the, cool, the, the nuclear reactor will become hot. It means that they will put in the uranium. And that means that if we will attack it there, it will be a second Chernobyl. And nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to do that because the only goal of this military action is to stop the program, not to make collateral damage. So it, it set a deadline for the time of the, of, of the attack. And another thing that he wanted is that the government will vote unanimously for the raid. He didn't want in the government or ministers that would say abstain or against. He said, I want everybody think it over and unanimously vote on it. The Minister of Defense, the late Ezra Weizmann, was opposing and he resigned. He was opposing for that because he was afraid that our important peace with Egypt will be broken because of that. So he, this was his view and he was opposing and he, he resigned. At that point, I was uh, one month after I returned from Hill Air Force Base. It's also a, a very short story because uh, um, our country, uh, Israel was uh, scheduled to get the F-16s, A's, uh, sometimes in eight, uh, 1984. However, and the first country outside of the uh, US and outside Europe was Iran. Iran has a, has a, um, a package of 75 F-16s scheduled to be delivered in 1980. And uh, they were manufacturing them back in Dallas, Fort Worth. And, uh, but in 1979, as you remember, the Khomeini revolution took place and the Shah of Iran, which was friend of the West, actually uh, had to leave the country. And at that point, the US government decided to embargo Iran and all the planes started piling in the backyard of uh, Dallas Fort Worth. So one, one came with a good idea and to ask the, the US government, why don't, you, why don't we take the Iranian airplanes? Look how history is fine. Let's take the Iranian air, uh, airplanes first. So it was agreed, and because of that, it was really hard to back here to U.S. with uh, uh, 12, 12 pilots, which was picked from the, from the other pilots' uh, squadrons. And I was chosen to be a squadron commander of, uh, of uh, one of the two squadrons that are in the base, base one in the north of the country. And we came here for checkup on the airplane. We, we flew 23 missions. We also threw two missions in the back seat to learn how to, to land from the back seat in order to uh, be able to be the trainer to instructor in Israel, and we came back to Israel. December, well, in November, we were called to the commander of the Air Force, myself and the other squadron commander. He told us that he wanted us to concentrate on air to ground. Because, and he said, why? And he said, uh, I don't want you to uh, start uh, dissimilars with F-15. It's too dangerous. And, and probably he had a, a phone call from one of our pilots who was here. He called his friend in F-15 quadron in Israel. He told him, clean up the pylons. Because uh, he was an F-15 pilot and he flew the F-16. He told them they have to clean the pilot from the airplane if they want to, to fight. And they were afraid of this... Uh, uh, hot between the two squadrons, and uh, then he said, you go to train air to ground. But this was not the reason, because one month after that, they called us, and there was a big map on the, uh, 
on the, on the wall with all the headquarters, and there was a circle there, and they said, here is a nuclear reactor. Okay, we look at the, at the range, 600 miles, straight line. And uh, we think that the F-16, that we both can do it without refueling. Okay, we went back to the squadron, we start training. We start making uh, uh, long, t long, long uh, range missions. But how can you fly 600 miles on a country which is 300 miles long? And, and uh, all of it is occupied, uh, inhab inhabitant, that you cannot fly over inhabitant area. So the only place we can fly is here in the Negev Desert, which is kind of 100 miles. So what we did, we start flying from our base here in the north. We flew back over the Red Sea here, because Sinai at that time was half Sinai was still in the hand of Israel. It's, it is only the, on, on, the, on the process of the peace of Egypt. So we flew down here. We flew back here, we flew back here, we bombed here, and then we started flying back and forth until we reached the, the, full, the full range. And also, uh, it was, has to be in, in a very high secrecy, because secrecy is all about it. If they will find that they come, then hell will come from the other side. If we can surprise them, we can handle the heavy air defense that was there. There was there. One brigade of SA-2, one brigade of SA-3, one brigade of SA-6, 200 uh, uh, shoulder-mounted uh, 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 SAMs, and, uh, and about 120 uh, quad, uh, 23 quad uh, um, anti-aircraft. Um, I don't know what the name of this is. Uh, ZSU-23? Yeah, that is the name. And, uh, and it was heavily defended. So the only way to penetrate that without any EW, because uh, we, don't, we didn't have whistles, and uh, uh, we didn't have any EW on the airplane. They would just clean Iranian airplane without anything, no chaff, no flares, nothing. And uh, so the only chance to penetrate this is to come really on the deck, smoking on the ground, and just make a real pop-up and bomb it and egress. So we start training on that. And then we found a problem. The airplane still didn't have any release envelope. Nobody released from the airplane 2,000 Mark 84 bombs. The, the, the American program at that point didn't do it. Uh, they didn't jettison the tanks in the presence of bombs. And we didn't know what happened because the, the tanks go like this, they can hit the, the stabilizer. So we, we started the program, a, a very crash program, with one very brave a pilot that took, took the, uh, the, the job to close his eyes and jettison the, the tanks, see what happened. And, and uh, we started the program for the release, for the, what we, we, we plan to do, because our job was in the reactor, the target was not on the surface of the reactor, but 40 meters down uh, to the core of the reactor. This is what we had to, to destroy, because there is the, the heart of the reactor. All the rest is uh, infrastructure, dome, and things like this. And in order to reach the bombs down there, the bomb has to penetrate 40 meters in the ground, and, and the trajectory of the bomb is something like this. So we have to calculate this, what, what is the delay of the fuse that we have to use, because we were using simple Mark 84 with the delay fuse. Two on the airplane, we have two uh, M9L, two uh, Mark 84 bombs, and three tanks. This was the configuration. I know that there are many stories that there were guided bombs and other things, and that we, we just hide behind the LL, uh, some, some kind of a uh, civilian uh, uh, tracks with, with the, it is all eyes. We just flew very low from here uh, we, we, because we were deployed here. This is an airbase near, near Elat. We just flew. This is about what we did. And then we came back same way 
Here, we, we climbed to 40,000 and negotiated the headwinds of the whole world, 100, and, 100 knots of headwind. And uh, it took forever because the sun is going down and we are chasing the sun and, and, and then it became dark. But never, uh, nevertheless, we planned this and we trained. But in January of uh, 1981, my EXO got killed in a mid-air collision in an air-to-air. We used to make a dissimilar uh, between F-16 and F-4s, two to three, because the two to two doesn't match. So we, we did it two to three, and uh, without any rules. It means that they can do whatever they want to do, and we can do. And in one of these, uh, uh, there was a middle collision between a Phantom and an F-16. The Phantom just blew the F-15 to pieces. And they both ejected. The navigator got killed. The pilot saved of the F-4, but the pilot of the F-16 was killed. It was my XO. And uh, that was a really, a really heavy. Uh, we, start, we continued to train. Uh, <clears throat> And then uh, in there was a decision that the raid will be taken on May 10, 10 of May. So we deployed down here to this base, from our base. Uh, and it also we decided to be taken on Sunday. Sunday is the day where the French technician didn't work on the reactor. We didn't want to kill. Uh, for no reason, French people in the reactor. So Sunday was the day. And we also decided to attack on one hour before dark. Why? Because we estimated that at least two, two pilots will have to eject there. If they survive the, the heat, they will have to eject. And the helicopter, the helicopters which, uh, which were even um, ho ho hovering here, fly to here, the CH-53 takes five and a half hour to get there. And the pilot who bail out has to survive, survive five and a half, a half hour there. So we decided that it's better to do it at night. So, but we don't, we not may commence a, a night attack. We don't have any means. We have to have an eye visual of the target. We did simple CCIP. And uh, CCAP in the F F16A is pretty accurate, between one to three meter CAP. And uh, that was enough to hit the, the reactor. And uh, we, so we decided on 5.35 will be the uh, time on target. And that was the deal on, on May 10. Uh, so May 10 is Sunday. On, on uh, Friday, we deployed. I told my wife, which is sitting here with us, that we are going to some uh, secret mission in the Red Sea. Nothing to worry about. Don't worry. And, uh, and uh, we had to spend almost two and a half days there. So what do you do two and a half days in a base? Nobody knew. Um, they put some barbed wires around the squad and that we were there. All the base was secluded from us, and uh, we were secluded from the base, and, and uh, we had to stay there for two and a half days. And this, this, this was, was terrible, because the number of jokes that I heard that was <laughs> enormous jokes, and all of them are uh, what you call black jokes. Oh, and uh, so we started to, to play basketball. So we play basketball between the two squadrons. My squadrons are all the height of me, the other squadrons are all tall, and we lost every game. <laughs> And then on, on, uh, on Sunday morning uh, of, of, the, of the May 10th, came a Beechcraft with a, with a whole brass, command of the Air Force, command of the Army. They came there, and uh, one of the intelligence officers brought the suitcase. Then when, when he, when he get back from, uh, when he uh, uh, disembarked from the Beechcraft, the suitcase opened. And a whole bunch of 25 Iraqi pounds was, was spread over the runway. So he didn't know until then where are we going. And when he saw Bank of Iraq, then he calculated, ah, they are going to Iraq. 
And they brought the, this uh, money and they gave us the money and said, okay, in case you have to, to do something after you jump, maybe you take a taxi or maybe you pay someone. <laughs> Here are the 25 Iraqi, Iraqi, it's a lot of money, it's like a 25 pounds, I think, British pounds. So we got this money and we get, had, a, had a brief. We went to the airplanes, we cranked the engine and we started, and then my, my technical officer came and said, I said, what happened? Why? He said, abort. So we, and you know what it is? After <laughs> you're ready, we aborted the airplane. We came back to the squadron. We were told that, okay, begging decide to abort. Okay? What do we do now? A hundred people already in the Air Force know about it. Secrecy is not an issue anymore because controllers, uh, other, other, uh, um, all the, the e E2C e people, the, uh, the helicopter uh, crew, all knew about it now, and, and it was aborted. Uh, so this was a disaster. And we also had to wait until we come back, until night, so at night we took the airplane, we flew back to our, to our base, and we didn't know what's happening. After that, we learned that the, um, at the same day, Menachem Begin met with President Sadat in Sharm el Sheikh. And Begin didn't want to, to embarrass Sadat because if we attack on the same day, the whole Arab world would think that Sadat was part of the conspiracy. And he didn't, he didn't want to involve him. So he decided, to, uh, he decided to delay. And then all of a sudden, after uh, five days, I think, uh, command of the Air Force was on some celebration of the, of the, of the um, uh, Sixth Fleet, which is in the Mediterranean, it was in Italy, and he, he went uh, to Italy uh, to meet uh, his friends from the Sixth Fleet, and from the, uh, on the way back, he called us in the squadron and told, we are doing it, day after tomorrow. So I had to go back, I told my wife, we're going back there to the Red Sea, but this time we didn't go on Friday, because it was two times. This time we, won't, we went on Sunday morning, but it was a holiday in Israel. Nobody flew, so we were the only one who flew this time. So we took off at about five o'clock in the morning. We sneaked along the sea, and then uh, and along the, uh, from here we sneaked along the sea, here we sneaked here along the border, and we landed in low altitude there. Radio silence. And we, we bring the airplane, they loaded the bombs. We went into a briefing. At the meantime, at the same week, the, the son of the head of, of the chief of the army of Israel, he was a pilot, he would get killed in this base in, the, in an uh, air accident. He flew in Mira uh, Kfir and he uh, lost control, he departed, and he tried to uh, get the airplane out, but he didn't, and he crashed and he killed. And uh, his father, chief of the army, came um, in, the, in the middle of the morning, uh, his morning, and, uh, and there was a brief. At that brief, I first realized what is the weight of this mission. Until then, well, I, I took it as, a, okay, it's, it's, a, it's a special mission, it's far away, it's a new airplane, first airplane that there is no connection between the stick and the and, the, and, the, and, and this um, stabilite or, or, or ailerons, it's only wires. It is the first time we flew this airplane. One engine, we was thinking what happened if the engine fail on us? And all this was, uh, was things that a little bit, uh, you know, concerned, but until then, until the chief of the army said, and he said this word that if we fail, there's only one chance. We cannot do it again. Politically, historically, we can only do it once. And if we fail, there is a chance of the annihilation of Israel. So I said, what? The whole nation is on our eight pilots' shoulders. This was the first time I felt that this is not a real mission, that this is something that cannot be failed. And uh, 
we stopped thinking about how to go back, how to come back. It didn't, it didn't mean anything anymore. The only thing that we're thinking, how we can penetrate this air defense and drop the bomb successfully. So all of a sudden, uh, it was very quiet in the briefing, heavy, heavy atmosphere. So chief of the army saw it, and so he called his, his um, aide and said, bring me the box. So he brought him a box of date. And he said, guys, here's the date. Take them, because you have to get used. There are a lot of dates in, in, in Iraq. You're laughing. <laughs> Nobody laughed. It was a silence until somebody, you know, burst in a, in a late ignition, what we called, and started laughing. And, and then there was another issue. All of a sudden, there was a miss. There was no, we're not sure what is the real time in, in Baghdad. And they started discussing it, because we wanted to get in Baghdad one hour before uh, sunset. And nobody could tell at that briefing, even to the chief, what is the time difference between Israel and Baghdad? <laughs> because we set the takeoff time uh, to, uh, to, uh, in order to attack on, on uh, uh, 3 p.m. Israel time, which is 5 p.m. Baghdad time, 5.35. So I looked around. I, I saw a Mossad guy there. I said, yeah, pick up the phone, call Europe, tell his agent to call Baghdad, ask him what is the time. And at the same time, asking what is the weather? <laughs> <laughs> because we were concerned that there would be clouds there. So, so he said, well, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> so after, five, after 15 minutes, we got confirmation that uh, we have in Iraq, we have a uh, two hours difference. And, and uh, so the, everything was set. Uh, OK. So another, another, another thing was that you know, there's always surprises. Always surprises. So we have a surprise. We planned to take off uh, from this base southward and make a big detour to, to, to go away from Aqaba and then join here to the... But we go out, to the, out of the briefing room, 30 knots wind from the north. And, and the base in all rate is 2,000 feet high. And we are loaded more than the book allowed on the F-16. We didn't care, but it is more than what is open on the F-16. So how could we take off southbound? We could not. So we had to take northbound. Taking northbound means that you have to go directly over Aqaba. So we did. So we took off directly over Aqaba, and what, guess what? King Hussein, he has a habit every Sunday to, to, to be on his yacht in Aqaba. This yacht is a, is, is a full uh, command center. So he, all of a sudden, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, <laughs> six, eight F-16s, six F-15s, zooming eastward. He didn't confuse. Immediately, pick up the phone. We know it because we intercept the, this call. He pick up the phone, and he calls Aman, and he said, the, the chief, of, the chief of, uh, of shift, call the brothers, tell them that the, the Israelis are on the way to Baghdad. And you know what? It is two hours before the attack. Luckily, maybe, the sergeant in Amman thought the king is a little bit drunk. <laughs> or the sergeant in H3 was thinking that the sergeant in Amman is drunk. At the end, they ignore it. But we pilots didn't know it, because it was a radio silence. But imagine the guys in the headquarters, commander of the Air Force, commander of the, of, of the, uh, of the Army, when they know this uh, thing, what should they do? And Raful said, press on. So we pressed on. Now come the dull part of the, of the story. We flew. Uh, there is a story I will tell you later, maybe if we have time. That I had a lesson learned, that if you don't fly low, 
there is a punishment word to you somewhere. And I had this punishment, so I will tell you, but at that time, I decided to fly low, and you have to push the stick very hard forward to fly low, because the, the, the ground is coming like this in a, in a speed of, uh, we flew 480 and 20 knots on the way in, in order to save fuel, and only on the last time we pushed to 600, but, at the big, uh, so, but it's still, very, uh, we fly 100 feet uh, most of the time, because we wanted to evade also the American AWACS, which is based in Tabuk here, and we know that the radio somewhere is here, so we wanted to evade this as well. And, uh, and we, we, uh, we flew very low, so all this way up to here, somewhere here, there was no something important, just the, uh, the problem that we didn't have maps uh, all this way. We all, the Israeli maps are, are, fi are finishing somewhere here. And all this area, we had to use American web maps, which were available to us, but they are 500,000 scale, that's what we had. So when we put, when we put the tracks on the American scale uh, map on the Israeli map, they didn't match. Two and a half miles, so where are we flying? And we took the coordinate on the way here from the American web. So really we didn't know exactly if we are on track or not. So what we decided to do, a, a, a seasonal a lake with an island. So we decided to, to catch this island and make position update on this island. And from this island to forget everything else because we here to here is 11, 11, some kind of 11 minutes flight, so give or take, we will get to, uh, to the target. Okay, we are, somewhere before that, we had to punch the, the external wing tanks, uh, just drags, but the, the, the central we didn't punch, because at that time we have in Israel only nine central tanks. Only nine, and we eight of them were in the air. So, <laughs> So uh, we were afraid that after that there will be a war and we need these central tanks. <laughs> so we didn't punch the central tanks, only the external. And I, I, I really, when I put the jetties on, I felt, I, I, I hit, I felt the bump, and as I moved the stick, well, it works. I'm still flying. And uh, this was one thing. Other than that, we came to this lake. We flew in two or four ships, which are which independently, separately, because we didn't want one, one guy navigate and take the whole bunch with a mistake. So all the time I saw the guys on the horizon flying here and here, but basically we were on the same, on the same highway. And when we get to the lake, I was, I was shocked. I looked there, water. I looked there, water. What is it? Did we get to the Gulf, the, the Passion Gulf? I didn't know what happened because there's not supposed to be water so, so wide. And then I remember that it's a 500,000 scale map. And this size of a lake is a big lake. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is more this whole area of Israel. And, and uh, so we looked for the island. It was not there because uh, um, it was it was uh, June and, uh, and it was, water was up, there was no, there was no island. So uh, we pressed on and all of a sudden we, we saw on the horizon colors, a lot of colors, red, yellow, green. And because we flew low, we didn't know what it is. But when we got there, we saw sails. People are sailing on the lake. We, it was a, a resort and we were flew about 30 meters, all of people, did this to us, <laughs> and it was jumping from, from, and although there was another incident that uh, somebody had a great idea, he said, we have to wipe up the signs from the airplanes, that nobody knows who we are. But Begin somehow heard it. He said, what? We are going to sneak like thieves in the night? You put Star of David like this on every airplane. So one day I came to the squad and I see the technician painting huge Star of David on both wings. And these people probably saw the Star of David, but I don't think that, that they realized what it is. And then we forgot, we pressed on, and then we saw the Euphrates.
Guys, the Euphrates is a huge river. Huge river. It's something I was also a little bit concerned. I, 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 I accepted a river. No, it was something, I think, over 200 meters. And, and then when, when we pressed it, there was another surprise. The whole area is high tension wires. The whole area is high tension wire. Where we are flying, up or down? So I saw the first guy in, doing like this, and then I decided, guys, we're going down there. So they, one, one told me after that that he asked himself, he wanted to ask me how to fly, but it was radio silence, so we couldn't, uh, couldn't tell him. But I fly casual. And then uh, there was the problem if we were pulled on, 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 the right, on the right place, because it was a pattern that we have to do, because we have to reach 40 degrees dive. Uh, this is the way we do. We pull to 50, and then we dive 40 degrees. And, and uh, it, it is very important that you don't pull up far, far or close to the target. Luckily, the Iraqi built walls around the reactor because uh, they, it was attacked by Iranian on March. Futile attack, nothing happened. But they built walls about 200 meters base and about 30 meters on, on the top, which a lot of, a lot of AAA on these walls, but the walls could be seen for about 10 kilometers, five miles. So uh, five miles, I saw the walls. I said, okay, God, what we call money in the pocket. And I know now to, to vector myself to pull on, on the right place, so we arrange it, we push. I decided to come close to the other four ship because I knew that in this case, the first one just wake them up. Second one, they aim. Third one, they shoot. Fourth one, they hit. And we are uh, five, six, seven, and eight. <laughs> so I, I said, OK, we go, we go here. And, 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 and when they flew here, I flew somewhere here. And we all pulled together. All of us pulled together. And, uh, and in the videos, from the pull up of the first one, Colonel Raz, and the pickle of the last one, Captain Ilan Ramon, sorry, the late Ilan Ramon from the Colombia, 50 seconds. So we call this raid 50 seconds over Baghdad. <laughs> and and uh, after, after, the, after the, the bombing, it was very clear, the dome was very clear, there was no problem, and we, we have to aim short of the, of the dome so the bomb can go inside the ground to the, to the core. And uh, my, because we didn't have uh, any cameras, you know, uh, um, uh, debrief cameras, but the cameras that looks back uh, on the F-16. I had to look back to see and to report. So I make a, a kind of a, a 270 to look there. There was a big, wall, big hole in the ground and a lot of smoke. So I guess it was destroyed. And then uh, we, we broke the, the radio silence. And um, the protocol was that everybody has to come up with a frequency and say one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, with the call sign. So we go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, silence. <sighs> call again. Call four, doesn't answer. I remember for the, from, from the Yom Kippur War that if somebody don't answer on the, on the frequency, you have to look down to find the, the smoke, the, 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 uh, the, the mushroom. So I start looking then, and my hair on the hand was standing. I was in the despair. And because Ilan was, he was the, the youngest guy. He was a captain. All of us were major and lieutenant colonels and one, one full colonel. And he was a captain. He was a, he was a young little boy. And I, I was so despaired that not, not to hear his voice, you can, you can imagine. So I look back, I look for everything is fine. And all of a sudden, the guy said, four. <laughs> <sighs> ah. OK, so we put our nose into the sun, because we had to uh, egress into the sun uh, to prevent some, uh, the, the guys, the bad guys, to to chasing us. There was a lot of missiles then, at that point. They started shooting missiles from all the batteries. But 
we saw them going in this di many directions, but not on us. We were very low, egressing from the, so there was nothing on the, on the RWR, so there was just a show of a lot of, uh, a lot of missiles, but the, air, but the AAA was tremendous. It was like uh, you saw in the videos of uh, Desert Storm, the first, uh, uh, the facts, uh, when you spent the night, this waterfall coming up to you. So it's the same in the daytime, the whole thing come up to you. But we ignored it because what can you do with AAA? Either we hit you or not. It's a matter of statistics. So <laughs> luckily we were on the, on the 99% uh, of not, not getting hurt, or the 90%. And after 40 miles, we climbed up to 40,000 and the exhilaration was skyrocketing. Even the commander of the Air Force, for the first time in the history, pick up the mic, what he doesn't do, and tell us, guys, this is the time to land safely. Because I landed only three times at night before this mission. So this is my fourth land, land, night landing on this airplane. And uh, we landed safely in the base. And uh, at 10 o'clock, after debriefing, we flew back to home. We forgot what we are doing. We flew supersonic. All Israel was booming and booming. And, 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 and there, was a, uh, there was a question in the parliament, why the Air Force is making uh, supersonic booms on the holiday? <laughs> you have it. And I landed. I went to my wife. I told her, hey, I was in Baghdad. Where? <laughs> in Baghdad. And then we went back to Tel Aviv. We went to a, a debrief. And uh, the whole government, with the, the whole uh, high staff were there, and they called us on the, to the podium, and they said, okay, tell us a story, tell us a story. So Raz, the other said, said, it was done according to planning. That's it. I said, what? <laughs> Where is the story? He said, no, it was done according to the planning. That's it. What? Sir, if you don't mind, I'd like to go back to episode one. <laughs> what made you want to be a pilot? Episode one, all right. I was a troubled boy from the beginning, making troubles. Uh, in the kindergarten, our system is that you have to go to the kindergarten two years before you go to school. But the, the teacher in the kindergarten said that she couldn't hold it anymore. I'm bored. I'm, I'm disturbing everyone. I'm knocking everyone. So they sent me to, to the Ministry of, uh, of Education to make an IQ test if I can go to school. So they make a mistake, I think, in the IQ. They had some zero there. And, and they sent me to school. I was five years old. I went to school in five years. So I, I finished school at 17. But you know, five years old, in, in the age of six, the boys were, and the girls were about two, two heads above me. I was a small boy. And in 17, I, uh, I uh, enlisted. And at first, uh, and I was uh, not a single boy, but I had two older sisters, but at home I was a single boy. And I asked my mother, the chair, to sign, because I, the mother has to sign if you have to volunteer to the Air Force. So my mother reluctantly signed, and I went to the Air Force. But I didn't manage. The, the first, the first uh, I made a solo in the Piper Cup, that was, a, and after that, uh, we, we started the, the ground training. And the ground training was, was very hard. We have to run 30 kilometers in one time. We have to do a, a lot of a single uh, two days and three days uh, treks with, with a big backpack. And I always time was taken back with the helicopter to the, uh, to the base. So one day, the uh, commander of the, of the academy called me. I was standing in attention. He took a, a note of 10 shekel, what it does, and he goes and he said, Nahubi, when you start shaving, come back. And they washed me out. I went to, uh, I re immediately called uh, uh, some kind of a friend of the family. He was a high uh, officer in the, um, in the armor brigade, and I told him, please, please, I want to go to the, 
to the scout of the, I need something that I can go back to Jerusalem. I cannot go back to Jerusalem if I some, do something. So they arranged for me uh, to be in, um, in the scouts, and I was there uh, until the Sixth Day War. In the Sixth Day War, I was there, and we went to, to the war with the scouts, and we, in the Sixth Day War, we, you, you know the story, but then one day, we were attacked by, by airplane, by MiG-17s. They were shooting like this because the gun is shooting up. And I saw them diving and they're shooting. And I was lying on the ground. And they were shooting at us. And I said, I have to be there, not here. <laughs> and right after the war, I wrote a letter to the, to the commander of the Air Force. And I told him, I am shaving. I want to come back. <laughs> <laughs> Surprisingly, after 10 days, I get a telegram. At that time, they got the telegrams. I get a cable, said, a report to uh, Ternov, which is one of the airbase, for uh, medical checks. So I reported there. I passed the medical checks. So they sent me to the, to the um, uh, Air Academy, it was in uh, Base 6 in Hatserim. And who is there? The commander of the, it's General Ivry. The, the, that's the first time I met him. And I, I said, do you want to be a pilot? I said, yes. Uh, I, and I told him, listen, Spare me this, uh, this ground training because I've already been in a war and I was sent me directly to the flight uh, training. He said, okay, you go to the Fuga Magister training. I, I graduated after one year. I was not the best pilot. Almost did it. And then they sent me to an Uragan. You know, Uragan um, airplane is a straight wing French airplane from 1949 with a big engine. And we flew that airplane. The stick was so hard in 400 knots, you can have to do you, to you, two hands to move it. And we flew this, and I flew in the uh, attrition war then, and then they moved me to Air Force. And in the Air Force, I came to the Yom Kippur War, the 70 war. Besides opera, <clears throat> you were involved in multiple conflicts, including Yom Kippur. Can you explain those? Yeah, I can. I think I can relate to two missions in the, in the Yom Kippur. I did a lot of missions in Yom Kippur, about 50. But uh, I think two missions are more significant. The first one is that uh, we were stationed before the war. On Friday, I came there. We were stationed here in, in Sharm el Sheikh. Uh, Sharm el Sheikh is here. And we were stationed there for night alert because there was a notion that El Al flights from Tel Aviv to South Africa may be jumped by, by someone, uh, Sudan, Egypt, Yemen, uh, someone there would jump and would shoot the airline. So we were stationed there to protect. But it was only a night, a night uh, alert. And you can put a wingman, because if a wingman is qualified, there's no lead. You can put a wingman. So we were two wingmen there uh, on, on Friday uh, of the 4th of October, or 5th of October. We went down there. And we arranged ourselves for, because the next day was uh, the Yom Kippur, which is a, a total dead anything. Nobody moved in Israel. So we didn't plan to do anything on that day. So in the evening, I got a call from headquarters, and they told me that we have to prepare because tomorrow there will be a war. I said, a war? With whom? They said, tomorrow we're going to be, uh, we're going, we are going to be attacked by, by uh, Egypt and Syria together, and you have to be prepared. They said, well, what do you want? And they say, we want to take you a five, five minutes alert. This is kind of an alert. So I picked up the phone to the, to the squadron. And I, I spoke to the squadron commander. And I told him, uh, there, they want us five. And there is no lead here, no flight here. Uh, what should we do? So there was silence on the other side. And they said, Nahumi, I appoint you as a flight lead in, in 107. And shut down. Telephone. <laughs> it, 
to become a flight lead in, in the air to air is half of God in, in our Air Force. It, it takes really a long, tra uh, a long uh, training and, and, and so I, I was only captain, young captain, so I, I took a grip. I went to speak to the, to the crew and I told the crew, guys, they're going to be a war. I, I, I give you permission to eat and drink. Because in Yom Kippur, nobody drinks, nobody eats. It's kind of a feast. I said, guys, you have to eat and drink. Tomorrow we're going to be a war. No, no, we are not eating. We are not. I said, you want me to write you down? I write you a letter down that I permit you to drink and eat. So, OK, we, we passed that. And, and then in the morning, we wake up, 9 o'clock in the morning. Nothing happened. Uh, a DC-3 lens. You know, DC-3 uh, lens and, and, a, and, a, and a colonel, full colonel come down. He's a reserve colonel and he tells me, who is the commander here? And we say, him. <laughs> and and uh, he called me and said, uh, okay, we have, we have information that at night, at the evening, a, com a, a heli commando helicopter will attack the base. What do you do? What can you do against helicopter at night? I said, helicopter at night? We never train. I don't know what to do. Anyway, we cannot lock a helicopter on, on, on a, on a, uh, with our radar. It doesn't lock on a helicopter. Uh, so what can we do? I ask him, maybe we can flare for you, and you can do, or where we can drop CBUs. What do you want to do? So uh, as we're discussing that, there is a siren. And uh, we, ran, we ran to the airplanes. We connected the telebriefing. The telebriefing is kind of a cable that connects you by, by, by telephone to the controller in the near uh, GCI. I talked to the controller, which is his master voice. He said what is told to be tell us from the headquarter. And I asked him, what's, what's going on? He said, I don't know. I just was told to, uh, to put you in a cockpit alert. But what is going on? He said, I don't know. And I asked him, OK, what do you see in the radar? So he said, tell you the truth, I see 20 MiGs. I said, where do you see 20 MiGs? I said, I see 20 MiGs on, on, the, on the sea. I said, head him where? He said, head him to me. <laughs> so so I, told, I, tell, I tell number two, crank, we are moving. And he said, no, 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 no. I have a strict order that you cannot take off before the attack. I said, what? He said, yes, they have to attack first, and then you can take off. I said, <laughs> <laughs> I thought, what do they know 400 kilometers from here? And I told the technician, uh, disconnect the telebriefing, because he was shouting. And, and we took off. I take off. 5,000 feet, I look back to see wingman coming, and I see on the runway plumes, like, like a cotton wool. I tell the navigator, Joe, look, they are bombing the runway. It is a war. And then he said, leave it. There is a, here's a MiG. I said, oh, oh yeah, you're right. And I, I turned to the MiG, and he <laughs> said, jettison. I said, okay, you're right. And I jettisoned. I was a really paralyzed, or I, I, my, the, I was regressed, from the, from the status of, 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 uh, of my uh, level in, in, in training to zero almost. I, I, and then everywhere I look, I saw MiGs. Everywhere. There were 28 MiGs there, and there were the two of us. So I told the other one, we will split, because uh, you will uh, stay over the field. I will go down to protect the Navy and the Hawk and the Hawk battery and the and the brigade. There was a, another complex there, and I went there. It was over uh, Ras, Ras Muhammad, and he stays. And I said to the navigator, "Don't look back. Just look at the radar. Try to find them." And but he didn't have to look at the radar because they're all all over. Now I don't remember exactly what happened, really. I only remember a picture. I remember a picture that I'm flying into four, four uh, airplanes that are, like in the movies, they are doing some kind of this spreading all, all over the sky. I remember that I was sitting in a circle in about 200 feet over the ground. Somebody behind me shooting me. I shoot, I'm shooting the, the one before in front of me. And uh, 
Then I got close to this MIG, and he started doing like this. And I couldn't get a real, uh, a real uh, uh, angle to, to, to shoot the missile. So I said, okay. So I, said, I shut the engine down, went down to 1,500 1, meters, and I waited until he stopped rolling. When he, when he stopped rolling, I shoot the missile. The missile got to him exactly when he was straight. And boom, it, it, it exploded. That was the first MiG. And I was, I was fascinated. I stopped flying because I saw this is one the pilot wants all his life, and you see this red plume with black that the MiG has exploded. So I looked at that, and the navigator shot me. So leave it. There's another MiG over there. And, and, and OK, so and, and then I, I came to a gun shot. I, I shot a MiG with a gun. And, and the navigator shot me, aim well. I said, yes, I aim in. But the, the F4, you have to, to use the rudder because the, the nose is going like this in a high AOA. And, and, and so I, I almost shoot half of the gun. And all of a sudden, I hear a bump. I, I feel a bump in the airplane. And say, so, OK, we hit. We hit. And uh, I told him, look backward. And he said, no smoke. So I look at the cockpit. I see one engine like this, one engine like this. So the gun shooting stole one of the engine. And I got a compressor stall. And it was about 200 feet over the ground. And there was a MiG here and a MiG behind me on one engine. So I, I didn't know exactly what to do. So I sort of, in, in a turn, I just shut the engine, opened the engine, shut the engine, opened the engine, and it's, it opened. And then I said over the radio, OK, it's OK. I have two engines again. And we started. At the end of this, there was four, uh, seven smokes on the ground, seven MiGs were on the ground. And uh, I shot one MiG that fell into the water. And we start circling. And here come the cavalry. Four uh, Mirage came. They came with full afterburner. And they, and, they, and they burned all the fuel until they get there. And we were now <laughs> six airplanes over the field, circling. And we look down, we see a big hole in the runway and a big hole in the taxiway. There's a one, one runway and one taxiway. So what do we do? Next, the, the nearest base, 200 miles from there. I have about 3,000 uh, pounds on the, on the gauge, all of us. And the Mirage has no, has no gas. So I decided, OK, I will, I will go first. I will land. So I, I, I remember that in, in, in the in the conversion course, they told us that on the, on the, on the carrier, you used to land like this. So um, part of the, of, the, of the speed was break into the, into the wheels. This is how it designed. This is how they designed the Air Force. OK, we'll try it. And we came on 23 degrees, pedal shaking. And, and, uh, and we just, just sink the airplane into the, into the runway. And it went, I think. Uh, the, the wheel was hitting the, the, the wings, but nothing happened. And then I stood on the brakes, just stood on them, and we're just running into this. It's not a hole, it's a hill. Because when the bomb hit the runway, it, it, it brings up the, uh, the tar, and it becomes like a hill. So I'm running into a hill, and I stop about this, this, this far from that. My, my knees was shaking, and I was, so I took the lowest voice that I can and said, we can land. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we make 180, we go down. I come to the, to the uh, alert position, a total chaos. People running from here. And I'm waiting for the, for the guys to come and, and make the clear on the gun to, to save the gun. And nobody comes. And we are standing there, engine working. Nobody comes to us. And then I stand in the cockpit. I start to call someone to come to us. And then somebody came. They put the, uh, the clearing. And uh, we couldn't get into the shelter because there was a bomb exactly in front of the shelter, unexploded. This was the reason why everybody was in a chaos there. They didn't know what to do. They came to the bomb. They went out of the bomb. And, and, and all of the time, when I, I took off my helmet, I hear the sirens. And this is also something that confuse people because the sirens said, ooh, ooh. And that makes people really uh, uh, confused. They didn't know what to do. So we went out of the airplane. And uh, I decided that we have to take off again because they will come back again. So we're looking for the Bowser. 
that have to fill up, there's no Bowser. Where is the driver? Nobody knows. There was Bowser standing there, nobody knows how to. And in the meantime, I saw my wingman go to the other airplane and start taking the, the, the missile out of it and put it in his airplane because we shot all our missiles. And they landed with missiles, so they start quarreling about the missiles. And then I, took, I called the other uh, leader and I told him, let's, let's split the missiles. It's all MID. So we asked the, uh, the technician to split the missile between us and them. So we had an, another two missiles. And we looked for the Bowser. We, we filled it. We took away, by the time the a bulldozer took away all the debris from the runway, they filled it with some sand, and we took off. And we actually uh, then patrolled about three hours, but nobody came. So that was the end of this, uh, of this mission of Yom Kippur. This was the first time. I claimed for five, I was credit for four. But That's okay. not bad. Whatever. <laughs> Uh, so the next, the next mission, shortly, I will tell it, because it has a, a point for the, for the raid, that uh, there was a night when, when the Egyptians crossed the canal, the Suez Canal, with, with the rafts. And, and the, the ground forces couldn't stop them, so they called the Air Force, but the area was fully uh, protected by SA-2, SA-3, SA-6, and it was night, that night. So they decided, we do a loft. And, and so they calculated the, the, the release range, and, and we start flying on the loft. But in order not to be uh, tracked by, by a SAM-6 like SAM or SAM-3, you have to fly very low. But it was a dark night, and I was scared. I couldn't, I couldn't push the stick to go down. I maybe flew 1,000 feet, and it's a sitting duck for there. So we're pressing in. All of a sudden, I see on the, RR, uh, on the RWR, I see this here, and it comes big, and it goes like this. And I know that they lock on me. So what can I do? I press on, another, another one mile to pull up. OK. We get to the pull up. I pull up, and here, boom, the sky become like a flash. I only saw the cockpit like somebody put a flash in the cockpit. I didn't see anything, just the cockpit. And I was somewhere here. The bomb released. And all of a sudden, it come black. Because, uh, and, and then, I like, I fly it like using the force. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe made a loop. Who knows? Because at the end of that, I, I found myself very close to the ground, but flying. So we went home. So we, we passed home. At that night, we lost six phantoms, six F4s in these missions. So I went home. I go down to the, to the squadron. I go to the uh, operation board, I see myself again. I said, are you, are you right? I'm going back again there? They said, yes, you, you have a lesson learned. You can go there again. So I had to fly another flight. And that time, it was a half a moon, and I pressed really low at night in order to evade this. And at this time, I don't know why. They didn't look at me. I just released it and come back. So I remember, if you don't fly low, some, sometime later, you will have a punish. They punish you. So this is a Yom Kippur, but there was a lot of others. Wonderful. So we're running short on time, but I did want to ask you what happened in 1982. 1982, it is episode five, Israel strikes back. Uh, there was, uh, we, we went into a, a fight in Syria over Lebanon because they deployed this, the same into Lebanon and they also, um, there was a problem with, so we went into there and uh, the plan was that we will knock up the, uh, knock out the, the air defense first and uh, we planned, I, I was planning this plan in 1979 when I was the headquarter and the, the idea was that the best EW is Mark 84. This is the best EW. And, and we, we, we made a plan of, of, of pop-ups, uh, a lot of pop-ups on, on the SAMs, and we actually destroyed the whole air defense in three hours. We just knocked it out in three hours, and it was clean skies. And after that, we just came in. But the Syrians, when the air defense was, was, was destroyed, they just sent the whole mix there. And, uh, and, and uh, it was a multi-boogie area, and in two and a half days, we, we shot down uh, one-third of the Syrian Air Force. 
in two and a half days. I shot myself six, and my squadron shot 23. Uh, the other squadron, 21. The F-15 squadron shot 35. So we totally shot 86 airplane to zero, to nothing. And in, in two and a half days, So that was actually the, 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 the war of the Air Force, because, because what, is an, what is a war? A war is, a, is a, the two leaders communicating with each other. And, ex and instead of exchanging a whole lot of, of lead between them, when you come with the Air Force and you destroy air defense, and then you saw one third of the Air Force, he understood, and in, in, in 10 o'clock at Friday, he put up the, the, the white flag and he asked for, for a ceasefire. But Menachem Begin said, we sto you stop the fire at 10 o'clock, we stop the fire at 12 o'clock. And we came there at, at 10 o'clock, I flew there, there was not a single airplane in the, in the sky. They, they keep up the, the ceasefire, and at 12 o'clock it was ended. Sir, Ms. Naomi, thank you for traveling here from Israel to be here with us. It's been fantastic for me, hopefully for you as well. Um, sir, is there anything else you would like to part uh, to give the class before we depart? As a matter of fact, yes. I want to say two things uh, about leadership and air power. Leadership. Do you know what the difference between the man in charge and a leader? So I tell you my, my view about it. Man in charge may be a commander, he or she. He orders people what to do. And his authority comes from the organization, from his rank. He may himself may be a loser. She, normally not a loser, but she can be a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> but they can order from the power of the organization. From another world, the manager in a corporate, he makes people do because he pays them. Again, the power of money. But a leader makes people want to do what he wants. And how he does that? It is not that he has to tell them, they guess what he wants, before he even said it. And he's not using some Jedi trick. They know what he wants. Why? In my view, there's a lot of virtue for a leader, and you, and you teach them. I have one thing that I think is the most profound. Lead by example. And people will follow you. People will believe in your, in your true uh, motives, you believe that you are really, you go the first, you don't send people when you're on a unit, they will follow you. And they will do whatever you want without even you telling them. This is leader. And secondly is the air power that I want to speak about. And I can say about this that in August, 20th of August, 1940, Sir Winston Churchill gave one of his famous speeches, which in the end, he said the immortal sentence, that never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. And, af and me, after being here for this week, seeing these giants, I don't belong to the giant, I'm a midget. They're, these are giants. Seeing them and hearing what you do there, I, can, I think that this sentence can be modified a little bit. That always in the field of human conflict will so much will be owed by so many to so few. So this is your destiny. <laughs>